Hey, back with Community Matters. It feels very scientific today at four o'clock on a given Tuesday uh, with Eva Mayarova, uh, who is a researcher in coral here in Hawaii. Uh, she's from the Czech Republic, and we want to trace her footsteps <laughs> and find out what, you know, what she's learned over the years and what motivates her. Welcome to the show, Eva. Nice to see you. Hello, Jay. Thank you for having me. So your laboratory is the Coro Research Laboratory. Can you describe uh, what and where your laboratory is, how it's staffed, what it's done, what it's doing now? Yes. So, so we are located at Coconut Island uh, within the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, which is a department under U University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, and our lab is located there. And it was founded by Dr. Ruth Gates uh, many years ago. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Ruth left us three years ago. And we decided to uh, go on and continue in her footsteps and uh, continue doing what she was so passionate about. And this was to trying to find a way how to save corals, how to protect and save corals in the changing world. So this is what we are doing now under the name of Coral Resilience Lab. And we are a group of uh, root descendants, let's say we are uh, a group of, of young early career scientists, a lot of uh, students, a lot of volunteers, uh, some technicians. So we are really very, uh, very uh, diverse group of people passionate about corals. Yes, and that's, a, that's the magic word, passionate, because, you know, you can't do the kind of drill down biochemical science you're talking about without being passionate. You probably wake up at three o'clock in the morning and see little visions of molecules, I bet. <laughs> yes, yes, it does happen to me. Yes, I, I already had some dreams that <laughs> led me to some discoveries. <laughs> so let's talk about how you how you got from the Czech Republic to here and uh, how you how you, um, when you learn to care. Um, about um, molecular science and um, research in, uh, in, um, in, 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 in ocean, re ocean research like this um, from a, a country uh, that was landlocked, mostly landlocked uh, back in Europe. Um, and, and now we're, we're talking about, um, you know, out, uh, we're talking about uh, ocean science. Yeah. Yes, that, so that's why I'm not marine biologist, but I'm molecular biologist and geneticist uh, because we have no sea. So it would be kind of ridiculous to study marine biology uh, in my country. But despite the fact we have no sea, we have a lot of divers and dive clubs. And uh, there is a big community of people who like to dive. So I started diving as part of university course with other students. Uh, so it was really cool and nice. And, um, and during the year we were diving in fresh water in my country, but then during summer we were going to the closest localities. So Mediterranean Sea, Montenegro, Croatia, or uh, to Egypt. So Egypt was actually the first underwater world I've seen in my life. And yet it's still the best so far, I must say. Uh, so that's where, where I, I fell in love, like literally fell in love at first sight with marine life and underwater world. But yeah, then, so I, I was still a molecular biologist and geneticist. So there was like very long way uh, to, to move to marine biology. So I have never actually uh, changed to being marine biologist. I'm still molecular biologist and geneticist. I just don't study humans anymore. I study corals. <laughs> There's no coral in the Mediterranean, is it? Well, there are some corals, but it's not the same as here. Uh, it's yeah. definitely not tropical coral reefs. Let's take a, just a moment to digress and, and tell people what coral is. You know, it's not just jewelry, right? Yes. Oh, oh I, I hope not. <laughs> uh, so coral, many people will think it's just a stone, maybe some animals living in it. But actually coral is very interesting organism because it is basically um, an animal that uh, secrets uh, stone-like structure as its backbone, and then it hosts little uh, unicellular algae, so plants, in its tissue so that it gets energy from them. So it's, it's everything you can imagine. It's a stone, it's an animal, it's a, it's a plant. All this together forms a colony called coral. So um, they're living beings uh, and they are in a community, a colony, um, and I guess they're interdependent. Um, how long do they live? What's it like? And what's the sex life of a coral? So they live 
they are very long-lived animals. Uh, you would say that in certain form they are immortal. Uh, so they, it means that they, a lot of scientists think that they can't die of age. Many of these reef building, big corals, we know that they've lived here for even thousands of years. If I remember well, the, the longest living coral uh, has been described uh, living more than 10,000 years. Maybe wow. it's maybe the record has been broken now, but that's, that's why uh, there is a lot of uh, assumptions that corals can't die. Uh, of age, but obviously they can die of all other uh, all other ways, uh, but not, uh, not not with age. And yeah, their sexual life, you know, it's um, it's coral, it's stationary, it can't really move. So you can imagine it's it's probably not the most exciting thing about corals, even though it's it can be really beautiful. So uh, my experience, for example, here from Kaneo Hebe is that uh, during summer during summer month, uh, if you go around uh, new moon and you will go into Kaneohe Bay at around 8.45 in the evening, you'll suddenly see a lot of little white uh, pearls floating everywhere around you. And these pearls are called bundles. And these bundles are actually egg and sperm together because there is one coral species, Mantipora capitata, and this species uh, is uh, releasing these bundles uh, to reproduce. So there's a lot of these bundles that will flow to the surface and then they will break, sperm and egg are released, and then there is, uh, there is fertilization that occurs everywhere in the ocean and little embryos first appear, then they transform into swimming larvae. And then these swimming larvae, they will swim and try to find a little hiding place uh, somewhere on the reef. They settle down and that's how new coral is born. And then you have to wait years and years <laughs> until you are able to see it. Because they they're kind of shy, very aren't they? Yes, they are shy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, can, you go, me, can you go down in the ocean there and grab those little, little things and yes. uh, so, take them back to the laboratory and examine them? Yes, so that's exactly what we are doing. So we have, so we either collect them in the field, meaning in the water of Kaneohe Bay, and either we put, uh, it's sort of, it's not a fishing net, but it's, it's, it's a kind of net with a Tupperware on, on the top of it. So when the coral releases all these bundles, they will go into the Tupperware, and then when all this is, is over, they'll just close the Tupperware, turn it around, and that's how we collect the bundles of individual corals, individual colonies. Uh, so yeah, this is this is what we do. This is how we spend our summer nights here in Kaneohe Bay. <laughs> <laughs> and you can watch them grow. You can create, uh, I don't want to say artificial, but say laboratory colonies of coral that way. Eh? Yes, yes, that's that's exactly what we do. Uh, uh, I have a colleague who is really crazy about rearing little corals. So every year he will rear literally tens of thousands of larvae into adults. But uh, the problem is, uh, well, it's not a problem, that's evolution, that's how it, how it goes, that corals, they will release like millions of larvae uh, during one night, but then the mortality is almost 100%. So almost all of them will die because something will eat them. Obviously, that's like a really, really good source of, uh, of fat uh, and of like all nutrition. Uh, nutrients, sorry, uh, or they will settle and they will settle at the wrong place that like a stone that will flip over so they will die buried in the sand or they just die buried in the sand because there is a wave coming etc etc so mortality is really high uh, in our lab we are able to get tens of corals of like visible sized corals every year for our experiments so that's and, so and we consider this very that... successful. Have any idea, you know, in the wild, how many of the larvae survive and how many die? It must be a relatively, there's a lot of them, but it must be a relatively small percent actually yes. survive in the colony, you know? Yes, it's definitely less than 0.1%. So uh, it's, it's way less than this. So it's way less than one, uh, than one in a thousand larvae that survives. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I, I don't know the exact number. I don't know if anyone knows the exact number, but it's at least, uh, at maximum, sorry, it's at maximum one in a thousand larvae that will survive. So theoretically, in a laboratory, you could generate uh, larvae. You could, yes. you could ma make them grow them. You could grow them in small numbers and in 
big numbers and and then you can take them back into the wild and you can re you can create a coral reef that way if you treat them properly am i right yes so in theory this is exactly uh one of the theories of how to save coral reefs how to make them more resilient is to outplant more resilient corals on the reef but the the most problematic part is that corals they grow so slow that some corals won't even grow one inch per year. So this growth rate is limiting almost everything we do when we work with juveniles, with freshly born corals. Uh, it will take them three, four years to be the size that can be transplanted out, like, out, out, uh, like put out in the field. But then it doesn't mean that they will survive because they will still be very, very small. So. Uh, that's the biggest limitation. So if you have 50 years, then yes, definitely, you can create a reef like this, but we don't have 50 years. We don't, we don't have that, no. Um, you know, and the other thing is, you know, people think of uh, coral as, um, you know, the, the structure, the structure in the water. They don't necessarily think of cor coral as separate animals, but I suppose I could go in the water um, and I could take one off, just one. And it'd be a di distinct, defined coral animal. And yes. how big would it be? And how would I take it off? And what would it be so like? Would it would it, it, um, it hurt me in any way? <laughs> so it definitely depends on the type of coral. But when we talk about what you call one animal, I would probably say one polyp. So corals, they have polyps. And if you go, if you take your mask and your snorkel and you'll dive uh, at the reef and you'll stay very still by a coral and you wait, eventually these polyps will go out of the skeleton and you will be able to see uh, tentacles with like little balls at the end of the tentacles. Uh, these are stinging cells. So that answers a little bit your question. Uh, your question. Yes, they can definitely hurt you. Some corals are stinging corals. Some people can be uh, allergic to corals. They are like, uh, they, they belong to the very same group as uh, jellyfish. So it's the same like jellyfish. You know, some jellyfish will hurt you, some won't. But in general, the rule of thumb is never touch any coral. And it's not only because of the corals, but you don't know what's living inside of them. Uh, there is like a lot of hiding places. There can be fish, there can be aggressive fish, there can be uh, 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 cone snails around it. There could be really a lot of stuff that can hurt you. And <clears throat> uh, also you can cut yourself. Corals can be pretty sharp, so you can have wounds, uh, cuts and injuries like this, and they can get pretty badly infected. So I would definitely recommend not to bring any corals back home because of all well, these things. When I first arrived here, you know, this is a long time ago, Eva, um, I went down to Alamoana Beach Park, you know, and I and there was a swimming area, and beyond that, there was a coral reef. And I said, well, that's beautiful. I can walk on that. And I started walking on it, and, and I felt the funny sensation of the corals uh, penetrating the bottom of my feet. And when I got back to the shore, I had cuts and, um, you know, uh, all over my feet. Um, and yeah. ultimately that got infected. It was quite a, quite an issue for me. It was, it was when I arrived, it was like, welcome, aloha. And uh, <laughs> yeah. what was happening there? Was that bacteria? Was, what, was that a toxin of some kind? Yeah, so basically if it gets infected pretty badly, I believe it's bacterial. Uh, you know, I, I won't tell 100% sure, but uh, very probably it's bacterial. Uh, marine world is totally different from what we are used to. Uh, bacteria, viruses living there, all the animals living there, they, they just live differently than we live here on the land. So our body is not used to it. Our, our immune system is not used to these bacteria. Um, uh, so that it can be very bad if you hurt yourself mm -hmm. underwater, yes. So um, one thing we, we well, let's, let's say, I, I want to know what it takes to make a coral animal happy. What, what kind of, <laughs> how can I tell the coral is happy? What do you do in the laboratory and what happens in the wild, in the field um, to make the coral mm, healthy, happy and live a long time? And on the flip side of that, um, what does it take to make a coral die and get, get sick and die? 
So a happy coral is a coral that has nice, bright corals, uh, colors. Uh, it will sit somewhere on the reef. It will have a fair amount of, uh, of sunshine. It will have, of course, salt water around itself. Uh, and it will have this symbiotic uh, algae, symbiotic plant in its tissue. So these symbiotic plants, as you might know, uh, plants can photosynthesize. So they can uh, create their own energy uh, from sun as its source, and they create uh, sugars like this. And that's, that's how plants actually like feed themselves. Uh, so this is exactly what the symbiotic plants do in coral. They are like little power plants of the coral. So coral uh, provide them shelter and provide them with some nutrients and these algae will give him back sugar to feed the coral. And a lot of these, uh, what we call a reef building corals. So corals that literally build the reef, these like majestic big corals, they are totally dependent on this kind of energy income. They are not hunters, even though sometimes they can hunt with their little tentacles, you know, they can hunt a little prey, but it won't definitely feed them uh, for long. So a happy coral has a, a good share of these symbiotic algae in its, in its tissue. Uh, what happens when the coral gets stressed or unhappy is that uh, these algae leave. So there's a lot of theories why they leave we don't know for sure. This is one of the research that I'm doing with my team is that we are trying to understand this mechanism, what actually happens when the, the algae leaves. But visually what you can see is that the coral will bleach. Uh, it means that it will change its color to white. Sometimes it will even be like bluish to pinkish little fluorescent colors. It can, it can get pretty wild, but the coral def definitely looks unhealthy to a trained eye. I mean, um, and this is something you can see during summer months here in Hawaii. We already had uh, multiple mass bleaching events where uh, majority of corals around the island of Oahu will go white and will bleach. So this is definitely a part when coral is not happy because it's uh, starving. It is very prone to be infected by viruses. Uh, it can't really defend any like harmful algae trying to overgrow it. You know, it's it's a sick coral basically, you know, not doing very well. Can you simulate that, uh, create that condition in the laboratory? How do you do it? Yeah. How do you make a, a happy coral unhappy? Yeah, so, so one of the biggest threats now, biggest stressor that makes these corals unhappy is heat. Uh, so it is it is very closely connected to the the, 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 the global change of climate. And it's mostly that there is more and more of these extreme weather events. Uh, it can be it can be uh, tropical storms, it can be hurricanes. It can be just like that the, the winds shift and suddenly uh, there is that there are less waves, the water st sits still, uh, it will get warmer. And like it, sometimes the water can get extremely warmer, you know, to temperatures that the corals are not used to. And th in this moment, uh, there is one of the theory that says that uh, these little uh, power plants, these little algae living in coral tissue will go crazy. They will overexcite themselves. You know, it's, it's a plant. So it will be like, oh, I have sun. I have like warm temperature. So let's, let's just go and, and, and create a lot of uh, energy, a lot of sugar. But the problem with this is that every time a plant or this algae creates sugar through the means of photosynthesis, it also releases what we call free radicals or uh, a, a term we use in the lab is reactive oxygen species. But people probably know this as free radical. And these free radicals are harmful. They are harmful for me, for you, for corals, for plants, for basically everything in this world. It's, uh, uh, it, it can damage DNA, it can damage uh, proteins, it damages the membranes. It, it is, you know, it's like an arrow uh, just going somewhere and, and destroying everything it goes through. Uh, so this is the problem. This is this is what happens, and then somehow the symbiosis is broken. Somehow the symbiont, the symbiotic algae, will leave the coral and leave it uh, energyless. Well, yeah, you know, it's so interesting that um, what you've done with um, the antioxidant approach, and, and the article in the paper talked about uh, something called manitrol. Uh, 
um, which is um, some kind of compound that's an antioxidant that it would help people, would help people whose uh, systems are breaking down, who have, uh, you know, uh, uh, their, their immunities are breaking down and so forth. Um, and so you give them antioxidants and they do better. But what struck, and, and of course, uh, as we discussed before the show began, antioxidants are good for all living things, including humans and coral and all of us. Um, and, I, you know, that's really important. As a, that'll be on the <laughs> final exam, you know. Uh, yes. <laughs> but yes. you know what struck yeah, me? Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. So it's a, uh, so, so we have like every organism have multiple layers of defense of stuff that can come from the outside. And antioxidant system is one of the basic ones, one of the uh, one of the systems that have evolved a very long time ago and has kept uh, has been kept by every organism that uh, that we know that I know right now. Um, and it's it's what I was talking about, like when you have these free radicals that are just like hanging around uh, you need to uh, get rid of them you need to scavenge them and this is what antioxidant system is for uh, so we know that in in humans uh, they can prevent some form of cancer they can even be helpful during some some cancer treatments you know when doctors give you uh, use some kind type of uh, treatment in your body they can also ask you to uh, get more antioxidants to like prevent your body from other type of damages, etc. Uh, so I, I also had this idea: what if it can help the coral? You know, maybe since we know that that uh, free radicals can be problem during heat stress. Uh, so what if we give the coral more antioxidants and it will prevent them from losing the symbiotic algae? And yeah, that's exactly what happened. And it's not only this, but we also figured out that if you if you teach coral how to cope with higher temperatures, meaning that you take this perfectly happy coral and you raise the temperature just a little bit, you know, just that the coral still seems fine, but it has the time to learn. It's like when I came uh, first to Hawaiian islands, you know, I, I couldn't just go to Alamoana beach at noon and just lay down, you know, and, and, and sunbath because I would get totally burnt. So I had to go, you know, on the sun in the afternoon and just like get my skin to acclimatize to it. So we did exactly the same with coral, except that we used heat stress. And so when we made the coral uh, learn a little bit of how to cope with heat stress, then we figured out that uh, antioxidant system or antioxidant defense was definitely one of the mechanisms that the corals uh, improved in order to be more resilient. So it's not just me adding antioxidants to the corals to make them more resilient, but it's also corals themselves who figured out that if they increase the, the, the number of antioxidants that they make in their body, it will make them more resilient. So that was fascinating, guys. It was a, a great result. That's a revelation. That's really important. But let me, let me uh, give you a line of uh, thought and see what you think about this. <clears throat> so if you take a number of different species of, of coral um, and you expose them to unhappy vectors, um, some, some species will do better than others. Uh, some will survive uh, even you know, in, the, in the face of adversity, others will not. Um, and likewise, if you take antioxidants and you give them uh, to a number of species of coral, uh, they will help more for some species than other species. <clears throat> and furthermore, that if you, if you do that, uh, you are building resilience for some species of coral. And the next time they are stressed by some negative uh, vector, um, you know, they, they will do better because they have developed a kind of immunity um, based on the antioxidant as people. Same thing as people. Yes. You have a better immune system. Okay, but I'm reminded of um, a, a, a movie we made not too long ago where Dr. Mora, who is a part of the university also, um, was talking about climate change. And he said, well, you know, you can go to the root cause of it. That is, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, in the case of climate change, it's, it's carbon. And it's, it's, it's the change of the planetary environment. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. Or you can do what he called adaptation. Adaptation means you simply adapt to the destructive decline 
of the planet. And uh, his point was that adaptation is a sort of a short-term thing uh, while the planet is degrading. And so I put to you this question. If you are uh, giving them um, the um, antioxidants and helping their resistance and resilience uh, while the planet itself is degrading and the conditions in the ocean are degrading, that's adaptation rather than getting to the root cause. Am I right? Yes, yes, you, you are perfectly right. So we are dealing with two problems. And first is, so you talk about adaptation. Adaptation, usually when, when, when researchers talk about adaptation, it's something that lasts through generations. Uh, what I was doing here was just acclimatization. So the same, like when I was talking about myself, I'm getting burned on the sun. So now I'm used to Hawaiian weather. But when I go back uh, to see my family in Central Europe, I stay there three, four weeks. I come back, I will get burned because my body won't remember it for this long. So this is also what we see that happens with corals. So we can we can make them learn from previous experience, but they won't remember this for too long. Uh, but by, we are doing these experiments because we, we want to understand all the mechanisms that have the potential to make corals more resilient. We study what they do by themselves. You know, we, we make them more resilient and then we look inside of them and we, we try to see like, oh, what, what have you done to become this more resilient coral? Uh, we also have corals that have already adapted to uh, increase temperatures. Uh, so, but this is just to gain the knowledge uh, and then we'll try to see whether we can help them a little bit. That's what we call assisted evolution. Uh, help them become more resilient in the future. But at the same time, we keep saying, this is not the final solution. This is just buying us time. Because with the predictions, the predictions are really bad. But some predictions say that by 2050, we might lose the vast majority of corals worldwide. Uh, and we don't want this, you know, we, we want the corals to survive a little longer, but at the same time, we must do something with the pace of climate change. We, we, we can't just say, oh, let's adapt, you know, it will be okay. It won't be okay. We can't adapt the whole planet. Uh, it's, it's impossible. So that, that there's like no way to, to not do anything with, with the, the atmosphere and with releasing uh, uh, emissions and all these things uh, while being like, oh, our scientists, they will figure out something. They will, they will make all the, the stuff we need uh, adapt. No, we won't, we can't do this. We, uh, we are not gods, you know, we, we, can, we can only only try to help the system a little bit to buy us a little bit more time. But the final solution is definitely to fight, fight the, the, the basics of the climate change, like the, the basic reasons of the climate change, which is yeah. uh, greenhouse emissions, uh, at the first place. Now that, that was his point too. But let me ask you this. <clears throat> so um, I'm John Q. Everyman, and I'm walking down Bishop Street, and you stop me and you say, um, you know, what do you think of coral? Um, what do you think about the fact that we might lose you know, a good percentage of the coral in the world's oceans and on the world's beaches uh, in the next few years? And he says, I, I don't care. I don't surf. Uh, I don't, I don't shop there, you know, uh, this, this is not my concern. And so what, um, what do you say to that man? Yeah, so corals are extremely important. Uh, there is like one third of everything that lives in the ocean lives at coral reef or very near the coral reef. Uh, almost 70% of, which is, uh, which is three fourths almost of, of all the organisms or everything that lives in the sea is somehow related to uh, coral reefs, at least some part of their life. So if we lose corals, we lose fisheries, we lose, uh, and, and people who fish, they will lose their jobs, they will lose their, uh, their life hoods. Uh, a lot of people in the world will lose the, the source of their food. Uh, we also, corals protect the, uh, protect the, the the coast. So uh, in Maldives, for example, when uh, during some developments, they destroyed the coral reef, then they figured out that they have to build artificial wall to protect the coast. And they paid $10 million per kilometer of this wall to be as, and, and it's still not as protective as the corals. Uh, in the United States, there is an estimate that all the coral reefs in the whole United States uh, protects 
uh, around $850 billion of infrastructure. So this is something uh, very important. Uh, reefs are the first barrier when there, are, when there is high surf, when there is hurricanes coming to uh, Oahu, people in Kenya Bay can be quite relaxed because there, is, there are so many coral reefs that they will just break the wave energy and, and uh, there won't be any, any big tsunamis or big waves you know, coming uh, to the shore during, uh, during hurricanes. So there is, there is a lot of stuff that corals are definitely good for. And if we lose corals, we will basically lose all the seas. We will lose the coasts. We will lose the coastal uh, environments like mangroves. There are no mangroves in Hawaii, but uh, or there should no, no, not be any mangroves in Hawaii. But in other countries, there are mangroves, and, and mangroves will also die off. And then it's you know it, it's like if you build a house of cards, and then and then you just like cut the base of it, everything will collapse. So this will happen when when if hopefully not corals uh, coral reef dies. But, but we don't want to give uh, the impression, do we, that um, coral is the only thing in the ocean environment that is being affected by, by global warming. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, Dave Carl, uh, National Academy of Science at uh, the uh, Seymour, the uh, Center for Microbial Oceanography Research, uh, where every gram of seawater is a universe of microbiology and it is changing dramatically over time. And so there, you know, there is, am I right? There's a million zillion things happening in the ocean that also have ultimately will have an effect on our lives. Coral is one of them, it happens to be very important, but there are many others, right? Yes, yes, it's like, definitely, it's like, it's like the, the land ecosystems. Uh, corals are like trees in the forest. But then forest is not only trees, it's, it's everything around. It's animals living there. It's, uh, it's animals living in the ground, uh, birds flying around. So coral, coral reefs are really like the, the housing unit, <laughs> I would say, for a lot of other life. But yeah, it's, it's definitely not the only thing, but it's the most visible thing and still not yet visible to, to enough people to care. Uh, there is uh, in the documentary Chasing Coral, I believe it was there, there is this quote that sometimes during some mass bleaching events, there was up to 70% of corals in some regions around Australia that bleached. So imagine that there is 70% of trees in a forest that suddenly lose leaves. People would panic. People, there would, there would be immediately so many organizations and people and politicians and like all the media would just look at that forest and ask the question why. But when this happens underwater, nothing really happens because people don't see it. And as you said, there's a lot of people who will be like, I don't surf, you know, I, I don't die. I don't care if the reef is there or not, but they don't realize that the ocean without corals is the same like land without forests. It's, mm -hmm. it's sad, it's it, deserved. It's all it's, interdependent. Yes. I don't, you know, David Attenborough, it's all interdependent. Yeah? <clears throat> so I want to I wanna take a trip with you, Eva, just for a moment. Into, into the microbiology the, of, of a coral and, uh, and ask you what you see there and how, um, say, the antioxidant affects that in, in terms of the microbiology. Can you talk about it? Give us a, a little voyage. So a uh, little voyage into, into molecular and cellular biology, of course. So um, what I was saying, for, for example, what we could see is that um, if, uh, if you heat stress a coral, there is a lot of signalization that suddenly uh, appears. You know, like every single cell in our body uh, signalizes and communicates with other cells. Uh, it's, it, it, there are like pretty, uh, pretty serious mechanisms going on. Uh, every action has its reaction. Uh, and this is what, what we are studying. So we are studying this like, signalization pathways and then execution of, of what coral thinks that should happen. So when coral is heat stress, one of these pathways that we see activated is so-called program cell death pathway. So it's something that is very important in the development. And it's a pathway that actually tells the one and 
particular cell, like you are no longer needed because you are harmful or we don't need you anymore or you are here like one too many. Uh, please pack your stuff and die in a very neat form. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, sometimes we call it cellular suicide. Uh, and it's not harmful for the organism. It's, it's, for example, how your fingers are made. You know, it's like when you are um, yeah, when you are embryo, you have um, it's it's like a disc here, and then at some moment of your development, the the cells in between the fingers will die off, and like through this uh, program cell death, you know, they are like not longer needed, so they will die off and they will release the fingers. Um, and, that, and that's so, genetic. And yes, yes, that's genetic. That's perfectly. That's that's programmed. Uh, that's a that's a very neat pathway so we can see that that some cells in the coral will act exactly the same so they they get the signalization and they are like oh something is happening uh we believe it's because they become harmful and they become become probably harmful because they harbor alg uh, algal cells these symbiotic cells that go over excited with the heat stress uh and they start releasing all these free radicals so then the the coral organism will be like oh we have some cells that used to be friendly cells, but now they are no, they are harmful. So let's get rid of them. So they they send these signals. So now I'm I'm just I'm talking in in terms of uh, it, it's hypothesis. You know, it's 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 nothing that if you ask another coral biologist, they will have probably a different explanation of what's going on. But this is this is my explanation based on what we are seeing in our results. Um, we also saw that there there is this pathway called autophagy. So it's a pathway that actually uh, tells the cell to uh, engulf something and digest it. So it's a, it's a pathway that will be like, please, you eat this, digest it, and then use the material to rebuild it for something new. Uh, this is, for example, one of the pathways that works in your fat, uh, uh, fat um, tissue. You know, it's like all this energy dependent, you know, how to how to like uh, store energy and then release energy. It's it's uh, it's it's through this pathway. So this is what we are seeing. And we also see that uh, under heat stress, if we do not teach corals how to uh, cope with it, uh, if, if we suddenly heat stress them, uh, their, their DNA is damaged and their DNA is damaged in an oxidative way. So we can even say, like, what is the source of the damage and we know that it's oxidative damage so it's still in the it, it, it's aligned with the theory that symbionts release a lot of free radicals and they just bombard the cells around them uh, they break their dna so again if, if the dna in the cell is damaged then the cell itself will be like ah, there is a problem with my dna so now i think i should kill myself because i could potentially harm the organism and it, this brings me back to cancer research, what I was doing, because this is exactly what cancer cells block. So in order to become immortal, this is one of the pathways that cancer cell must block in itself. The uh, cancer cell, that's, that's this philosophical question I was having, how to kill something that will not want to kill itself, you know, because that's, that's, the, that's the, the basis of, the, of, the, of, of, of normal cells is that when you tell them to die they will die but cancer cells won't uh and yeah that's <laughs> that's, a, that's oh I, that was my next question you anticipated <laughs> my next question and so when you you know dig deep and drill down into the cellular structure you know microbiology of the coral and see how it reacts and see how the you know the genetics compete um you know with the, the development of the cells um you're learning things and i know you know you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and you say gee why don't we try this and why don't we try that and what else can we learn about this what what could it must be very exciting and what you know what new conclusions can we draw and in your mind am i right in your mind eva you're looking for a larger truth and the larger truth would apply to all living beings, especially all human living beings. And those lessons, those discoveries could, could help us, you know, help, help human beings deal with cancer, no? Yeah, yeah. so defini definitely uh, corals and marine life uh, and the study uh, of corals and marine life is very helpful in cancer research, mostly in drug discoveries. Uh, that's not something I do, but uh, yeah, that's also one of the questions, one of the, the things when you said what are corals good for, uh, we can get a lot of 
cancer treatment drugs from chorus and and underwater life but that's that's just like a um a, a side thing but but what you were saying is partially true partially not so of course i'm trying to figure out a bigger uh, bigger uh, uh image of how molecular things live but right now um our understanding of coral molecular uh, mechanisms are so limited that I usually, uh, most of my time, I go to see cancer literature and I read stuff that has been discovered in uh, cancer and I try to apply this knowledge to corals. Uh, anyway, there are things that corals can be used to understand better uh, humans. And for example, one of the things is what I was talking about that corals probably cannot die by age. And we know that uh that longevity and uh, uh, and aging and all these things are also connected to several uh molecular uh molecular traits one of them are so-called telomeres for example i don't know if you've heard about them it's uh the, the ends of chromosomes and they shorten uh, well, telomeres, during life. yes yes yeah, yes telomeres they get shorter and shorter so that's that's what i used to work in cancer field i used to work in uh in telomeric field i was i was uh, um doing research on telomeres uh so that's uh now we believe that studying corals and coral telomeres and how they uh cope with aging without actually getting their telomeres short shorter and live almost forever uh, that could be pretty interesting uh, for for a human field to understand because there are conditions people can be born with condition when they age prematurely because something is wrong with how they maintain their telomeres. Uh, so we believe that maybe if we get the lesson from corals, if we understand how corals take care of their telomeres, how they maintain them, that could be very helpful in the field of, uh, of human aging. Yeah, right. I, if they can live for 10,000 years, so can we. It's the fountain of you two. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> One last question, Eva, and, and that is, um, you know, how, how do I uh, get your job? Uh, what do I need to do to study this? So how can I get into your field? Um, where do I go? What do I do? And how do I mm, spend my time and my intellectual energy? So I, I, I studied molecular biology and genetics uh, at, at college, but uh, basically when I look at my colleagues, everyone has studied something different. So what I would say is that you need to study something biology related, you know, and then and then you just find your place uh, on Earth. You know, you, you just uh, the most important thing about the research is to get passionate. If you if you are not passionate, that's why I left cancer field. I. I loved it, but I was not really passionate. I was not waking up at three in the morning, you know, to to read something about like new drug discoveries in cancer. Uh, but I do almost <laughs> wake up at three in the morning, uh, just like dreaming about corals and and what we are going to do next. So uh, I think that as soon as you are passionate, people around you will see it and and will want you to be in their team and and help them. And this is something that that. Uh, Professor Ruth Gates, she was awesome in this. She saw potential in every individual person, and she always tried to give them exactly what they are passionate about, exactly what they are good at. And she was combining people from very different areas uh, of, uh, of, of study, uh, very different fields, uh, because she believed that if we all know something different, and then we sit in one room, we can get some pretty good ideas. And some crazy ideas, but you know, like <laughs> that's also part of science to try crazy ideas. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Uh, Eva Mayarova um, in the Coral Resilience Lab at UH. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you know your discussion here today and your good nature, and we understand <laughs> we understand what it takes. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you for having me here. It was a pleasure, Jay. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha. Bye.